Most Holy Father, we welcome you this evening from the heart of London, from the hearts of all of us here in Hyde Park, and from the hearts of all those united with us in prayer on television, radio, and the internet. This afternoon, Holy Father, as we were preparing for your arrival, we reflected prayerfully on how the Catholic Church plays its part in harnessing the spirit of humble and loving service through the work of its agencies and charities at home and abroad. As a Catholic community, we know that authentic Christian life must be grounded in a daily spiritual encounter with the living God and in fulfilling the command of Jesus, love one another as I have loved you. We have come from all over Britain to share this historic moment with you and to celebrate and rejoice in the truth that God loves every human being unconditionally, irrespective of race, color, or creed. With you this evening, we witness to the joy of being a follower of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, who stands at the door of every heart, patiently waiting to be let in. Holy Father, where we stand has a profound historical significance. Over 400 years ago, Catholic and Anglican martyrs witnessed to their faith in Jesus Christ when they were put to death at Tyburn, a short distance from here. We give thanks to God that in more recent times the Christian churches in our land work together in the light of the gospel for the common good of all in this country. There is so much that unites us, and we are committed to continuing the search for that visible unity for which Christ prayed. During our liturgy this evening on the eve of the beatification of Cardinal John Henry Newman, we will spend time in Christ's presence, meditating on the scriptures and on Cardinal Newman's life and words. We pray that our hearts will be ever more open to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit so that our lives may radiate the light of Christ to those around us. Finally, Holy Father, we assure you of our love, our support, and our prayers for your ministry as Chief Shepherd of the Church, for coming here to confirm us in the faith, and especially for teaching us by your own example what it means to be steadfast in our fidelity to the person and teaching of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Holy Father, for being with us this evening and for leading us now in this vigil of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with Let us pray. God of truth and love, your Son, Jesus Christ, stands as a light to all who seek you with a sincere heart, as we strive with your grace to be faithful in word and deed. May we reflect the kindly light of Christ and offer witness of hope and peace to all. We make our pray prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. This is what I pray, kneeling before the Father, 
from whom every family, whether spiritual or natural, takes its name. Out of his infinite glory, may he give you the power through his spirit for your hidden self to grow strong so that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. And then, planted in love and built on love, you will, with all the saints, have the strength to grasp the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, until knowing the love of Christ, which is beyond all knowledge, you are filled with the utter fullness of God. Glory be to him whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory be to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up the hill. There he sat down and was joined by his disciples. Then he began to speak. This is what he taught them. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the gentle. They shall have the earth for their inheritance. Blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what is right. They shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful. They shall have mercy shown them. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted in the cause of right. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people abuse you and persecute you and speak all kinds of calumny against you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hilltop cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp to put it under a tub. They put it on the lampstand where it shines for everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine in the sight of men so that seeing your good works, they may give praise to your Father in heaven. This is the Gospel of the Lord. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is an evening of joy, of immense spiritual joy for all of us. We are gathered here in prayerful vigil to prepare for tomorrow's Mass, during which a great son of this nation, Cardinal John Henry Newman, will be declared blessed. How many people in England and throughout the world have launched for this moment it is also a great joy for me personally to share, to share this experience with you. As you know, Newman has long been an important influence in my own life and thought, as he has been for so many people beyond these aisles. The drama of Newman's life invites us to examine our lives, to see him against the vast horizon of God's plan 
and to grow in communion with the Church of every time and place, the Church of the Apostles, the Church of the Martyrs, the Church of the Saints, the Church which Newman loved and to whose mission he devoted his entire life. I thank Archbishop Peter Smith for his kind words of welcome in your name. And I'm especially pleased see, to see the many young people who are present for this vigil. This This evening, in the context of our common prayer, I would like to reflect with you about a few aspects of Newman's life, which I consider very relevant to our lives as believers and to the life of the Church today. Let me begin by recalling that Newman, by his own account, traced the course of his whole life back to a powerful experience of conversion which he had as a young man. It was an immediate experience of the truth of God's word, of the objective reality of Christian revelation as handed down in the church. This experience, at once religious and intellectual, would inspire his vocation to be a minister of the gospel, his discernment of the source of authoritative teaching in the church of God, and his zeal for the renewal of ecclesial life in fidelity to the apostolic tradition. At the end of his life, Newman would describe his life's work as a struggle against the growing tendency to view religion as a purely private and subjective matter, as a question of personal opinion. Here's the first lesson we can learn from his life. In our day, when an intellectual and moral relativism threatens to set the very foundations of our society, Newman reminds us that as men and women made in the image and likeness of God, we were created to know the truth, to find in the truth our ultimate freedom and the fulfillment of our deepest human aspirations. In a word, we are meant to know Christ, who is himself the way and the truth and the life. Newman's life also teaches us that passion for the truth, intellectual honesty, and genuine conversion are costly. The truth that sets us free cannot be kept to ourselves. It calls for testimony. It begs to be heard, and in the end its convincing power comes from itself and not from human eloquence or arguments in which it may be couched. Not far from here, at Tyburn, great numbers of our brothers and sisters died for their faith. The witness of their fidelity to the end was even more powerful than the inspired words that so many of them spoke before surrendering everything to the Lord. In our own time, the price to be paid for fidelity to the gospel is no longer being hanged, drawn on, quartered, but it often involves being dismissed out of hand, ridiculed, or parodied. And yet, the Church cannot withdraw from the task of proclaiming Christ and his gospel as saving truth, the source of our ultimate happiness as individuals and as foundation of a just and human society. Finally, Newman teaches us that if we have accepted the truth of Christ and committed our lives to him, there can be no separation between what we believe and the way we live or live, or every thought, what an word and action must be directed to the glory of God and the spread of his kingdom. Newman understood this and was a great champion of the prophetic offices, office of the Christian laity. He saw clearly that we do not so much accept the truth in a purely intellectual act as embrace it in a spiritual dynamic that penetrates to the core of our being. Truth is passed on 
not merely by formal teaching, important as it is, but also by the witness of lives lived in integrity, fidelity, and holiness. So those who live in and by the truth instinctively recognize what is false, and precisely as false, inimical to the beauty and goodness which accompanies the splendor of truth, veritatis splendor. Tonight's first reading is a magnificent prayer in which St. Paul asks that we be granted to know the love of Christ which surpasses all, un all understanding. The Apostle prays that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we may come to grasp with all the sense, the breadth and the length, the height and the depth of that love. Through faith we come to see God's word as a lamp for our steps and light for our path. Newman, like the countless saints who preceded him along the path of Christian discipleship, taught that the kindly light of faith leads us to realize the truth about ourselves, our dignity as God's children, and the sublime destiny which awaits us in heaven. By letting the light of faith shine in our hearts and by abiding in that light through our daily union with the Lord in prayer and participation in the life-giving sacraments of the Church, we ourselves become light to those around us. We exercise our prophetic office. Often, without even knowing it, we draw people one step closer to the Lord and His truth. Without the life of prayer, without the interior transformation which takes place through the grace of the sacraments, we cannot, in human's words, radiate Christ. We become just another clashing symbol in a world filled with growing noise and confusion, filled with false passes leading only to heartbreak and delusion. One of the Cardinal's best loved meditations includes the words, God has created me to do him some definite service. He has committed some work to me, which he has not committed to another. Here we see Newman's fine Christian realism, the point at which faith and life inevitably intersect. Faith is meant to bear fruit in the transformation of our world through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the lives and activity of believers. No one who looks realistically at our world today could think that Christians can afford to go on with business as usual, ignoring the profound crisis of faith which has overtaken our society, or simply trusting that the patrimony of values handed down by the Christian centuries will continue to inspire and shape the future, future of our society. We know that in times of crisis and the people God has raised, raised up great saints and prophets for the renewal of the church and Christian society, we trust in his providence and we pray for his continued guidance. But each of us, in accordance with his or her state of life, is called to work for the advancement of God's kingdom by imbuing temporal life with the values of the gospel. Each of us has a mission. Each of us is called to change the world, to work for a culture of life, a culture fought by love and respect for the dignity of each human person. As our Lord tells us in the gospel we have just heard, our light must shine in the sight of all, so that seeing our good works, they may give praise to our Heavenly Father. Here, I wish to say a special word to the many young people present. Dear young friends, only Jesus knows what definite service he has in mind for you. Be open to his voice, resounding in the depths of your heart. Even now his heart 
is speaking to your heart. Christ has need of families to remind the world of the dignity of human life and the beauty of family life. He needs men and women who devote their lives to the noble task of education, tending the young and forming them in the ways of the gospel. He needs those who will consecrate their lives to the pursuit of perfect charity, following him in chastity, poverty, and obedience, and serving him in the least of our brothers and sisters. He needs the powerful love of contemporary religious, contemplative religious, who sustains the church's witness and activity through their constant prayer. And he needs priests, good and holy priests, men who are willing to lay down their lives for their sheep. Ask your Lord what he has in mind for you. Ask him for the generosity to say yes. Do not be afraid to give yourself totally to Jesus. He will give you the grace you need to fulfill your vocation. Let me finish these few words by warmly inviting you to join me next year in Madrid for World Youth Day. It is always a wonderful occasion to grow in love for Christ and to be encouraged in joyful life of faith along with thousands of other young people. I hope to see many of you here, here in Madrid. And now, dear friends, let us continue our vigil of prayer by preparing to encounter Christ present among us in the blessed sacrament of the altar. <coughs> Together, in the silence of our common adoration, let us open our minds and hearts to his presence, his love, and the convincing power of his truth. In a special way, let us thank him for the enduring witness so that truth offered by Cardinal John Henry Newman. Trusting in his prayers, let us ask the Lord to illumine our path and the path of all British society with the kindly light of his truth, his love, and his peace. Amen.
Christ have, mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God, our Father in heaven, God the Son, Redeemer of the world, God the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, one God. Heart of Jesus, Son of the Eternal Father. Heart of Jesus, infinite in majesty. Heart of Jesus, 
holy temple of God. Heart of Jesus, tabernacle of the Most High. Heart of Jesus, house of God, and gate of heaven. Flame with love for us. Heart of Jesus, source of justice and love. Heart of Jesus, full of goodness and love. Heart of Jesus, wellspring of all virtue. Heart of Jesus, patient and full of mercy. Heart of Jesus, generous to all who turn to you. Have mercy. Heart of Jesus, fountain of all life and holiness. Have mercy. Heart of Jesus, source of healing. Have mercy. Heart of Jesus, sharer in our sorrow. Heart of Jesus, safeguarder of the vulnerable. Heart of Jesus, friend of the betrayed. Heart of Jesus, companion of the ignored. Heart of Jesus, face of the misjudged. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, wounded by our failings. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, bearer of our sufferings. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, acquainted with grief. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, atonement for our sins. Heart of Jesus, overwhelmed with insults. Heart of Jesus, broken for our sins. Heart of Jesus, obedient even to death. Heart of Jesus, pierced by a lance. Heart of Jesus, source of all consolation. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, our life and resurrection. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, our peace and reconciliation. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, victim for our sin. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, salvation of all who trust in you. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, hope of all who die in you. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, delight of all the saints. Have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. heart. Let us pray. Father, we rejoice in the gifts of love we have received from the heart of Jesus, your Son. Open our hearts to share his life and continue to bless us with his love. We ask this through the same Christ, our Lord.
everywhere I go. Flood my soul with thy spirit and life. Penetrate and possess my whole being so utterly that all my life may only be a radiance of thine. Shine through me and be so in me that every soul I come into contact with may feel thy presence in my soul. Let them look up and see no longer me, but only Jesus. Stay with me, and then I shall begin to shine as thou shinest, so to shine as to be a light to others. The light, O Jesus, will be all from thee. None of it will be mine. It will be thou shining on others through me. Let me thus praise thee in the way thou dost love best, by shining on those around me. Let me preach thee without preaching, not by words, but by my example, by the catching force of the sympathetic influence of what I do, the evident fullness of the love my heart bears to thee. Amen. Amen.
make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, let me sow pardon. Where there is discord, let me sow unity. Where there is doubt, let me sow faith. Where there is error, let me sow truth. Where there is despair, let me sow hope. Where there is sadness, let me sow joy. Where there is darkness, let me sow light. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, in this great sacrament we come into the presence of Jesus Christ, your Son, born of the Virgin Mary and crucified for our salvation. May we, who declare our faith in this fountain of love and mercy, drink from it the water of everlasting life. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
Sing along. 